Mandy Burrows here um, with Brad Pruitt, who's the Executive Medical Director for Connected Health Group at ICON. Thank you for joining today, Brad. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Um, first of all, obviously, we've seen a lot of change um, over the last year or so. Um, it'd be interesting to hear from you um, what you think the biggest changes you've seen over the last year for clinical research and healthcare. Well, great. Thank you. Um, and so I'm going to be coming at these responses. Uh, we're the I'm executive medical, medical director for the Connected Health Group at, at ICON, and so um, overseeing our our mobile health platform and the technology uh, solutions that are getting deployed. And um, so I'm going to have that lens on it versus say a clinical operation lens or some other lens. So um, I think the biggest thing has been before. The, the pandemic uh, coming in and, and trying to push patient patient centricity at home visits, uh, the hybridization and the decentralization of trials always seemed to be a you know a nice to have. And we're looking at patient centricity and, and you know that's something we want to get into, but they never looked at it. And I would always use examples of uh, I'm here in San Diego, so I would use if if there's not a, a forest fire. Uh, fires going on, uh, blocking your way to the clinic. Uh, there might be some torrential rains or something else that's blocking your way to the clinic that you just never know. You might not be able to have your patients come in and you have to have some way to be able to continue those site visits, either push them to another site or be able to have that visit done at home, or maybe it's done with technology and you don't even have to have a, a you know, visit to happen. It can be done through a video visit. So I, the biggest shift now is when we go and talk to pharma sponsors, that's what they're asking for as a risk mitigation strategy. It's no longer a nice to have. It is, uh, we definitely want to have a risk mitigation strategy in case we can't have folks come into the clinic. We have to continue our clinical studies and push things forward. So I, I, I feel that's the biggest mental change that I have seen and just the way people look at how they want to uh, mitigate risk um, and, and, and you know, it's great that it's patient centric, but they're not even looking at it at that anymore. I think it's more of this is something we have to do uh, now in order to continue our trials and not have them uh, you know, be pandemic proof, more or less. So, and yeah. right. then I guess along those lines, um, we used to have to provision a lot more um, either either tablets for the sites um, that had a, a camera on them or sometimes we would provision that just a USB uh, camera so that they could conduct the video visits. and. Uh, now it seems almost all of the clinics that we look at and the um, qualification, uh, they're they're all set up with telemedicine and ready to go nowadays. So it's it's become a first line uh, option, not a nice to have risk mitigation. Yeah. You know? mm. And so obviously <clears throat> you mentioned their virtual and remote um, trials, um, big change in the last year. Um, have you seen there have been gaps in going virtual or remote for clinical research healthcare? Definitely. Um, and again, kind of looking at, at this from uh, more of the, the technology lens, um, I mean, the first thing that comes is that a number of these scales, uh, the, the, the patient reported outcomes, um, you know, they're validated, they have specific rules. Um, and uh, you know, one of them that came up uh, many times that, that uh, we still don't have a, uh, an at-home validated answer for, I'll just use the six-minute walk test as a perfect example proxy of a scale that um, we, there, it's not a technology shortcoming. There are apps and ways to even passively measure the um, uh, the needed times for uh, the six minute walk test. But it's, um, you know, in reality, you're supposed to have the same um, clinician uh, doing the, the performance rating uh, so that they coach the patient the same and they're supposed to be doing it in the same, uh, the same hallway um, and it's the same, you know, same uh, surface, uh, very flat surface, same hallway, same coaching and everything. It's just to keep it consistent. And so uh, we've had a number of studies that have looked at that specific scale, trying to do that uh, at home, uh, either with a home health nurse. And um, you know, that's just a perfect example of a way that we really need to start pushing um, new ways to get some of this uh, data out mm -hmm. of uh, you know, without having to have the same exact hallway and the same exact person coaching them every single time. That seems pretty archaic at this point in time. So uh, I think that's what needs to be pushed. You also with the home nursing, um, you know, some of the, the PK draws and some of the samples that have temperature control and they need to be analyzed right away or they need to get in a centrifuge, cold centrifuge right away. 
um, there's there's been some uh, push uh, in, in that area also. Um, and uh, I think as things move in this hybrid decentralized, um, that's definitely where things are going in the future. So I, I think things are only going to improve with better uh, services done at the home and uh, improvement mm -hmm. of using technology to record that data, um, even passively, not necessarily having to be coached by the mm -hmm. uh, clinician. So you mentioned uh, looking to the future. Um, what do you think that future looks like for kind of ECOA, PROs, e diaries with all the new kind of technology and apps and sensors and everything? Yeah. Um, so I, I I've been saying for for quite a number of years now that uh, you're using a patient reported outcome is still biased. It's still not. Um, you know, it's a it's a subjective account of how the patient quality of life, right? Uh, you're, you're still you know, a pain scale. How do you feel on, on your pain level today? And I might say it's a it's a six today instead of a seven because I was taking a pill, whether it's placebo or not, but I just, I don't know, I feel a little bit better or I think I'm feeling better, so I might say six. Mm. Um, I, I think that that's, uh, that the data can be coming in passively um, and then you're going to use the patient-reported tools as more of a, uh, confirmation. So uh, as an example of um, activity, you could have a, a sensor, an actigraph watch or an eye watch or something that's actually tracking their, their movement and activity. And then every so often you ask a quality of life uh, questionnaire that is confirming the data that you're seeing. And that might actually cause some questions. If they say they're feeling horrible, uh, the quality of life has gone from a, an eight down to a five or something. And, um, but their activity hasn't changed. You know, it, it, like I look, I see the same amount of vigorous activity, sedentary, you, you have not changed your activity levels. You know, why are you now saying your quality of life is a five? So I think that a lot more data coming in passively, um, less burdensome for the patients and, and getting recorded in between the visits and then more or less using the, the visit time and the patient reported outcomes to confirm what you're seeing in that passively recorded data. So, I mean, there's gonna be a lot of data sources, um, new data sources all coming in. What does the future look like for the platforms to support and integrate those um, data sources? Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's the push that you're seeing from the traditional uh, point solution, uh, kind of the traditional ECOA providers um, the shift now going to more of an end-to-end -end, uh, platform to where you're not having one one solution that got acquired or is used for e-consent and another one's getting used for ECOA and another one's getting used for the video visits and another one's getting used for your um, uh, mHealth medical device recording. It's the ability to have all of that on, on one platform. And I, I think obviously you're seeing you're seeing that in the industry with some of the new leaders uh, uh, coming up in the space uh, that are out there that the support from all the way from the enrollment management to um, uh, integrating with the, the systems for randomization, uh, the EDCs and or uh, a data analytics container in, in some cases, instead of an EDC where you're just getting the, the source data put, piped right in and you don't need an EDC where you have to go and do all the edit checks because it was either recorded from a medical device or it was recorded directly from a, a patient uh, Z source. So I, I think that's been the been will be the push is just making these systems um, and and end to end platform and being able to integrate all of these different data sources as you just said is is going to be more and more important and to have that capability um, in real time and not have to wait for a device to come back in to be downloaded. Right, and um, with data, um, there's always going to be questions over data processing, data privacy, and I'm thinking particularly with global studies that span many different regulatory boundaries. Um, how do you see that? You know, I um, I, I think uh, most of the world is, is kind of watching this growth in, in the, the cryptocurrency uh, as well. Which kind of, um, I know it's been around for quite some time, but but you, you want to look at the, I know it's kind of a, an odd comparison probably is, is looking at the decentralization of clinical trials as well as the decentralization of uh, blockchain and being able to, why do you have to record your data in one uh, on one device, pipe it all to one central database and then have it uh, be analyzed and the data be crunched and um, 
not in real time and at a different location? Why not have things being done? Uh, everyone's got, uh, you know, they say the phone has, has more uh, operating power than the Apollo uh, rockets back in uh, early days of NASA. So uh, why don't we utilize in the same way that blockchain is utilizing a decentralized um, chain of computers that consistently and uh, constantly are, are validating um, the, the security, the privacy, and ensuring that everything is uh, secured um, and have that processing power that everyone carries around in their pockets, uh, having things be analyzed right there in a true decentralized fashion, and then it can be done in real time. Um, and that data is going to be uh, much more useful when it's analyzed and you get insights uh, immediately instead of just a, a, a chunk of data that you have to have someone else go look at and, you know, a month or two down the road. So uh, I think that's where things are heading. It's fascinating. Yeah, exciting um, potential, definitely. So thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it very much, Andrew. Thank you.